It's time for Supply Chain Now, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. On this episode, we're continuing an end-of-year uh, mini-series of sorts where we're going to get insights and POV from our incredibly talented stable of hosts. And today, we're going to be working really hard to raise your procurement leadership IQ with our dear friend, the one and only Kelly Barner. So quick program, pro, <laughs> easy for you to say, quick programming <laughs> note before we get started here today. Hey, if you like this conversation, be sure to find us and subscribe for free wherever you get your podcast from. Uh, so you don't miss conversations just like this one. All right. So let's welcome in, no further ado, our featured guest for today, Kelly Barner, owner and managing director of Buyers Meeting Point, co-author of a slew of successful books, including Finance Unleashed, Leveraging the CFO for Innovation, and host of one of our newest series here at Supply Chain Now, Dial P for Procurement. Kelly, good afternoon. Hey, Scott. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. You know, we, we have been collaborating for a long time now. It, it, it continues to evolve, and we are so excited about kind of this latest iteration, which is this Dial P for Procurement. So very excited about that. And for, for anyone who doesn't get the reference, who doesn't happen to be sort of an old timey movie buff. Uh, so Dial P for Procurement actually comes from the old Alfred Hitchcock classic Dial M for Murder. So we're going to have a little bit of mystery, a little bit of intrigue, but lots of energy and probably a few surprises. I love that. <laughs> you know, you came prepared. Uh, I didn't know if you or I was going to share that Alfred Hitchcock angle, but you nailed it as always. So we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, so let's, before we get into business and, and um, the series and some of your observations, let's get to know for, for the handful of folks that may have missed some of your earlier appearances or some of the other work you do, tell us a little bit about Kelly Barner. Sure. So uh, my original plan was to be a college professor, English literature before 1700. I was big Shakespeare, Chaucer, all that kind of thing. <laughs> kind of missed my mark. Somewhere along the way, I did end up writing books. It just wasn't what I thought it was going to be about. Uh, I have three kids. Uh, we have a cat named Boo Boo. That's what happened when you let your kids name your animals. Uh, I live in the Boston area and I have been in and out of different procurement roles for nearly 20 years now. So I've been practitioner, I've done consulting, I've done the independent thought leader thing, and I absolutely love the procurement supply chain space. Outstanding. And one of your life's mottos that we realized in one of our first interviews is don't be a jerk. Life's too short for that, right? Yes. Do not be a jerk. Hashtag no jerks. Seriously. <laughs> and for anybody that has ever taken any kind of entrepreneurial journey, you know that it's very exciting and it's hard and it's wonderful. But one of the best things is you get to make decisions about who you want to work with. And right. to me, that's the number one filter. It's not worth all the additional risk and stress and, and pressure and all that if you have to deal with jerks. So that's cut number one in my book. Well said. And, and that's, we already got our first t-shirt, t-shirt-ism. That's the number one <laughs> yeah. filter. No jerks. Hashtag that's no right. jerks. Check out the Dial P fashion line. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So moving right along. So 2020 goes out saying, uh, not just in a, an historically challenging year, but just mm -hmm. such a unique year for so many different reasons. So, you know, here at year end is we're able to kind of take inventory of, of so many takeaways and business lessons, good and bad. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what are, what's that short list of, of key takeaways for you here? I think, you know, the, the first one is just being so incredibly proud of the professional community. I've had some funny conversations over this time. I've had some heartbreaking conversations. I've spoken to managers that are stressed on behalf of their team and their team's families. Uh, but the fact of the matter is everybody really rallied. I mean, people were working in weird places. They were, you know, you'd see animals go by, children would go by, you'd hear weird things in the background, but we kept things rolling. And 
I think that's something that all of us should sit back and kind of take stock of and, and be grateful for. Uh, but something that follows on that, that I'm starting to see more and more is that there's also a fall off. I think we're getting to the point where we've been apart from each other for long enough. Some of the communication patterns are starting to break down. If there's been team changes, they're not really sticking the way they would if everybody was in person. Um, and just kind of communication dynamics. I think it's not quite as easy to be rude or brusque with somebody when you're looking into a Zoom camera as it would be you know, in an email, for instance, that's kind right. of a classic mistake. But it's a little bit easier. People start to feel a little bit less real when their face is on a screen versus when you actually read someone's whole body language in response to a situation. So I think we're going into a time now, I'm actually hoping that a little bit of a break over the holidays, we'll let everybody recharge because it's going to be this way for a little while. And I think we all have to mind our P's and Q's, right? Be empathetic towards what everybody has going on. Um, but at the same time, not let the business slip. Agreed. Agreed. And, and that's a great point. Uh, we, we all certainly miss the in-person element. We do. Whether, you know, you, it's creating podcasts or conversations where you're around a table, right? In a studio and, and you got this, that almost that instant camaraderie and kindred spirits. Absolutely. That's really challenging to recreate uh, remotely to your point because you, yeah. people communicate and they've got different comfort levels and, and rapport building changes dramatically when you are remote. And it does. Whether you're creating content or to your earlier point, like your examples, you're navigating business waters and problems and, and opportunities. All absolutely. of that communication changes, right? It absolutely does. And we've had to learn to, I think, combine visuals and audio differently. You know, it's one thing, even to think about how do you feel differently watching a movie versus listening to a podcast? There is a dimension that's missing there. And so we're lucky that we have the technologies that we do. We're lucky that we have the connectivity that we do, but remembering where that falls off, sort of like knowing the difference. When should this message go through email? When do I need to pick up the phone? It's really giving thought to that human dynamic in every single situation that we handle, good news or bad. Excellent point. Excellent point. All right. So before we ask you about a key Eureka moment, one of our favorite questions here, anything, any other takeaway that you want to reference from 2020? I think the other key takeaway, um, obviously none of us have gotten to travel much, if at all, but I live in central mass. So there's been a couple of times I've had to move around the state and I found myself up on the mass pike. So if you've ever driven on the pike, it starts in the city, goes right straight out west through the middle of the state, continues right on into New York. And one of those times, you know, we were in the midst of all this bad news. Everything was bad and we're on the pike heading west. And I'm just looking at the vehicles around me. And I started to mentally count the trucks. Like it's all trucks. There's, I'm sure there were passenger cars and, and there were different little delivery vehicles, but by and large, it was 18 wheelers. And I almost felt kind of choked up about it because back to that point about the visual versus the audio, just seeing all these trucks on the road, the risks these people are taking, the time away from family. It was very emotional seeing all of the trucks rolling. And I felt so excited for our industry and so proud of the drivers. They really are heroes and they've put up with a lot this year. And I am so proud to be on the corporate end of the work that they're doing every single day. Uh, outstanding thought. And um, you're absolutely right there right there front line, just like our healthcare, just like anyone else. Absolutely. Helped us keep moving forward. And it's That's a great right. visual. And I also say as being a big old YouTube junkie, YouTube is my favorite. Um, I probably spend more time on YouTube than traditional TV these days, just because of all the ways you can watch traditional yes. TV on YouTube. And my favorite part though, Kelly, is all the different niches uh, that you can learn about, whether it's supply chain related, business related, That's otherwise. Right but including truck drivers. There's a lot of truck drivers that document their experiences on YouTube. And i tell you, it has been fascinating to watch that side of, uh, of the world. So excellent call out as always. So let's talk about, you know, this Eureka moment. We all, you know, some days you have several, uh, at least weekly, you know, monthly and a year like 2020, <laughs> you might have oh my a, God. A yeah. plenty every in, in, you know, day in and day out. What's been one that uh, has been your, um, you know, your, your 
a compelling, intriguing one on your end? I think for me, I'm going to give everybody a break and skip the 2020 Eureka's. Most of those, you know, involve some non-ladylike language. So we're just going to skip over those. But when I think back early in my career, there were a couple of pivotal moments that actually followed very closely together that have changed the way that I've thought about managing my professional journey. And the first one was, <clears throat> so I was working in procurement, managing hired services for a large grocery chain. And I had transitioned from another job in the organization. So it was something of a lateral move. And one day, this is like every team leader's worst nightmare. Somebody started talking about salaries. Oh, goodness. And I found out that because I was one of the few people at my level that had transitioned laterally instead of being hired in, I was making half of what my peers were making. And I was absolutely devastated because I worked hard. And sure, I, I transitioned laterally and maybe I didn't come from the same kind of role as they did, but I also had knowledge of the company. And I felt betrayed was sort of my initial reaction to that. But then the more I thought about it, the more I recognized, okay, well, this is what it is. And I have to own the situation. And so that's when I made the decision to start looking for roles outside the company. And the role that I ended up really deciding to push for was a consulting position at mTaurus. Uh, it was an e-sourcing provider, much like Ariba. They were purchased by IBM at the end of 2011. So newer folks to industry may not be familiar with them, but at the time they were one of the big dogs, right? And so I was gonna join the consulting team. I was so excited. And I had to do this big case study interview. This is how they interviewed. And I found out, again, salary. I found out the salary for the job I was going for. And because I was making so little, and it was a much higher level role, it was like four times what I was making. <laughs> wow. And I instantly thought, well, I'm not qualified for that job. Mm. And I stopped working on the case study. I mentally gave up. And I went to speak to one of my mentors and she gave me the advice that don't get so wrapped up in the numbers. Go for it. Make a push. Worst thing that happens, you learn something, you get some feedback, you interview someplace else. But of course, I had given up. And so I had stopped working on my case study. Mm. And boy, that interview was coming. I went sleepless the night before the interview. I did not sleep. I worked for almost 36 hours straight to get my case study done. Wow. And I got the job. And those two lessons to me combined you got to own your own career. If you don't like what's going on around you, leave, right? Take ownership over that. But then also don't ever sell yourself short. You know, put yourself out there. Don't worry if it's a big salary. You are qualified. If they're willing to meet with you, you are potentially qualified for that job and you absolutely ought to push for it. I've never forgotten those two lessons. Those for me were enormous eureka moments. Um, Maybe wish I had dealt with one or two of them differently, but <laughs> boy, did I learn good lessons on that. And it had a happy ending. So I love that. Good life lesson. Yes. Huge life lesson. I, I think, um, I think of the confidence journey or individual confidence journeys that we're all on. You know, we all don't arrive yeah. at, at the same stations at the same time. And, and we all get those Eureka moments earlier or later or at different Absolutely. points in the career. But once you feel like you've got your fate in your hands and you accomplish something with that, um, uh, with that in mind, that just, it's like you rip the blinders off and, and the sky's the limit. And, and uh, it's a very empowering moment when you have that realization. It is. And I think for me, it's scary to sort of be responsible for your own journey, but it's also empowering. And at the end of the day, I would rather be in charge of my situation, even if it means by making a mistake, I hurt myself through an opportunity. I hurt myself, you know, through some kind of financial loss. I would still rather own my own situation than be sort of at the whim of other people. So it's a little scary. You got to take on some risk, but it's always better to own your own circumstances. Agreed. So I want to, um, uh, before we talk about 2021, one thing to watch for, I want to keep down this theme of empowering others. Yes. Here recently, uh, we uh, published a podcast on Mary Barra which is uh, chairman and CEO of General Motors, right? 
Yes. And as we got to know her story better, well, she started at GM at, at 18 and, and worked in a wide variety of different aspects of this behemoth, this global behemoth. Yeah. And one of the big things she did, speaking of empowering others, is as she became basically the global leader of human resources for uh, GM earlier before she be, you know, became the, the fearless leader, she took a 10-page General Motors uniform policy, 10 pages uniform policy. And she, she trimmed that all the way down to two words, dress appropriately. <laughs> and she, <laughs> she got Brave a Brave woman. <laughs> yes. And she got a lot of feedback, positive and a lot of negative from people, yeah. various people. But one of the great points she made, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have her quote in front of me, is, hey, if you can't, if you're, if, as a frontline manager or as a supervisor, if you can't manage the dress appropriately, then what else can you not manage, right? And and she really, rather than use that to beat her her uh, supervisors and managers over the head with, she really used it as a means to empower, let them make decisions and manage these things, not create this massive ten page policy. That's right. When for so many people in this massive organization, it could it could really truly be that simple. And I think as leaders. Uh, Kelly, I'd love for you to speak to, you know, we were just talking a minute ago about how empowering ourselves through that journey, mm -hmm. but as leaders, we also have to empower others, whether they're colleagues or, uh, and, you know, team members or what have you, right? We absolutely do. And before I comment on that, I just need to say for anybody who's never managed uniforms, what she did was so scary. <laughs> I can't even tell you. I wouldn't have been necessarily like thrilled or upset about it, but I have sourced uniforms. That is one of the most hot button HR issues there is that procurement will ever touch. That was, she was a risk taker. So kudos to Mary Barra for, for right. taking that risk. And I, I do hope it worked out well for everybody, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think in terms of empowering others, the most important thing we bring to the table is perspective. That we can see other people in ways that they can't see themselves. Sometimes that means we can see a strength that they don't know they have. Other times it means we're noticing a pattern of things going wrong or perhaps a troublesome trait that keeps popping up. In both cases, it's incumbent upon us to say something. You have to be empathetic, you have to be respectful, you have to choose your words wisely. But just like Mary with putting those small choices in the hands of her managers around what the team needed to wear, I mean, what's appropriate? You ask me what's appropriate, that's one thing. You ask, you know, <laughs> went shopping for gym pants one time with my daughter and she's trying to talk me into wearing all these crazy patterns. Her, her thoughts on appropriate, very different than mine. Like, no, no. Grownups, we wear black leggings to the gym. Like we all wear black leggings, that's appropriate. She's like, no, nah, tiger print and rainbow, you know, no. So a lot of different perspective needs to come into it. And I think as long as the words that you're saying come from a place of wanting the best for someone, you can help them recognize their strengths and apply them better, you know, channel good energy. You can help them learn alternate behaviors if there's something that's constantly getting them into trouble but it does require that risk you have to put the choice in their hands give them the information and then they're either going to do it or not but i love the fact that she was willing to distribute ownership to those other teams and then trust that it was going to go well or trust that she and hr were going to be able to handle it when it didn't you do have to continue taking those risks and maybe it's a big, big risk at the high level. And the, maybe the risk becomes a little bit smaller as it gets right. distributed among everybody. But you got to distribute the work. You got to distribute the information. And you have to distribute the responsibility. Because mm. if you don't hand out that responsibility, no one's ever empowered to do anything. And it's such a loss. Yeah, I agreed. And, and, but to your point, for, for folks that, um, uh, that you're trying to empower, they have to accept it. They have to be willing to embrace it and, and make decisions and, and uh, embrace some of the uncertainty, yes. you know, and, and so there's responsibilities on both sides, both leadership side and, 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 and say the, the, the team member and employee side. So I love that, especially as we hear more and more 
about the employee experience, right? We've heard about yes. customer experience and consumer experience and, and uh, user, user experience. experience. Yes. And now we're hearing a lot more about the employee experience, which I, is a welcome, welcome breath of fresh air. I agree. All right. So we're, we're, we're foreshadowing very nicely, Kelly, by the way, because we're, th- we're talking about you know, <laughs> things coming and, and to yes. come. So as we thankfully turn the page, turn the calendar page of 2021. Oh, I'm just glad we're here. Uh, what What is one thing that, you know, that you would suggest that that business professionals, procurement professionals, supply chain professionals, what have you, uh, keep their eye on? So I do think a big thing is the sort of downgrading of interpersonal relations. I think that needs to be very important. I also think as we come up almost on a year, right, of, of going through this whole business, We need to prevent our short-term habits from becoming a very small-minded cycle. So especially back last February, last March, even last April, none of us could ever see more than like three, four days in advance. And so you were making, you know, tiny little iterations, little decisions. How far can I see? Okay, I'm going to make a small choice. And then maybe it started to extend to a couple of months. But even now, there's still enough uncertainty around vaccines and travel restrictions. And now we have the virus kind of morphing in in Europe. And so it's leaving us with this feeling of uncertainty. And I think that we have to extend our planning cycles as far as we can. We have to be willing to revise them as new information becomes available. But one of my worries actually comes back to, you know, my focus is so much on content, written content, audio content. And for the last 10 months now, everything's been about COVID, everything, everything. And I'll think to myself, are we all gonna look back and say, there's like 10 months worth of unusable content because it was so specific to this time, everything's about COVID. I'm a little bit concerned that that same dynamic is going to exist and have a lasting negative effect on businesses. So I think we're also focused on getting through the here and now. Well, two years from now is going to come. And are we going to be prepared? Are we not going to be prepared? I think we have to force ourselves to deal with immediate, medium-term, and long-term. And we have to constantly revisit that. But one of my concerns for businesses is that if we don't push ourselves to still try to think three to five years in the future, we are going to miss so many opportunities because there are companies that are going to come out of this better than they went into it. Some of that is going to be dictated by circumstances but some of it is based on the attitude and the risk assessment of managers and decision makers in those companies. To a certain extent, all of us can do something strategic and position our companies better, but I'm, I'm really worried and it's hard to do, to say, okay, we don't know what January is gonna be like, how am I supposed to think about 2025? Right. But it's those teams and companies that can push themselves to find the energy and foresight to still do that, despite how hard it is, that are really going to come out better on the other side. You know, very well stated. And um, I, I saw one of the big four publish a study uh, that we could expect uh, seismic disruption in our in our supply global supply chains every three point seven years. I think is what the study said. And it, and it really is interesting because um, you know while the, while the pandemic and and this certainly is on a different scale than so many. Uh, have ever experienced and, oh, and yeah. some of the challenges are so unique. However, you know, we, we've got geopolitical hotspots uh, that fortunately have, have not erupted and have, would have all the potential of being a seismic dis- disruption to, to supply chain and beyond. We've got uh, other threats, cybersecurity, every, every other oh, day, absolutely. you read about um, different threats, uh, current penetrations, uh, potential threats. I mean, they're, they're the potential to keep net to, to, for disruption after disruption. I, I really look at 2020 and, and I'm very thankful that one of the silver linings is that pr- the profession, I'm not going to use the word resilient because it's overused mm-hmm. and, and so many folks have forgotten the definition. I came across this uh, supply chain brain article where this author was talking about the anti-fragile supply chain. <laughs> Uh, cause every supply chain has some degree of fragility, right? Absolutely. But the silver And if lining, it doesn't, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> right. It needs to have some fragility. 
right. But I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the part of the silver lining here is that uh, we are better off in so many different ways, uh, both from a leadership experience standpoint, from a, um, uh, how we overcame certain mm-hmm. unforeseen challenges and, and how we can apply all those learnings and, and the risk management and the modeling and you name it to what that next disruption is going to be because the chances are it could be just as disruptive. Right. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, I, I hate the, I want to, I want to end on an optimistic note. So let's, <laughs> let's make sure we do that. Yes. But, let's absolutely do that. <laughs> that's the profession that, that, that supply chain's in, right? Uh, it is, you know, what, what's that next, uh, scenario to, that to be prepared for. Um, all right, but there's, there's plenty of good news. And, and that's one of the things I'm really excited about with dial P for procurement, because we're going to hear so much good news, best practices, uh, personal stories, how the profession, especially in the procurement space is changing and evolving. So yes. tell us a little bit about what we can expect uh, from Dow P for procurement? So one of the things that's actually really nice about doing a procurement focused show within the supply chain now network is that there's already this context. It's not like saying, okay, I'm talking about procurement versus talking about finance. We're talking about procurement versus supply chain, right? Where a lot of the business listening audience might kind of see procurement and supply chain as the same thing. You know, within supply chain, there are so many different disciplines, you know better than anybody, and the same is true of procurement. And I think part of what's going to be exciting about this is that because we're doing procurement in this context of folks that really know the nuance, know the different challenges, we're going to get to talk about different styles of managing spend through technology, through process, through specialists. We're going to get to talk about different ways of partnering with third parties around products, around services, collaboration. And we're going to get to talk about some of the different leadership styles, because there's a lot of change that's been going on in procurement actually for a pretty long time. Right. And one of the things we did see this year, you know, we would talk about like, okay, there was a tsunami. Okay. There was, you know, this economic issue, right. Recession in, in 2008, 2009. And we always kind of go through the same thing where we say, but is anything really going to change? And pretty much nothing ever did. Well, guess what? It's different now. Right. Like this time, it really changed. We don't need to ask that question anymore. We've learned which parts of our digital transformation efforts were real, which ones were sort of digital theater and didn't mean anything. They just kind of laid a layer over a broken process. But you can't do that when everybody's working from home. So we have our work cut out for us, um, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And there's a ton to talk about. And I'm actually very excited. It does come back to this whole user experience, employee experience. We touch a lot of different groups from the C-suite to distributed buyers to suppliers. We're one of the few teams in the company that's regularly dealing with outsiders. Um, and I think there's huge opportunity for us to collaborate with sales. You know, we're, we're always pushing, how can we affect the top line? Can't do that without going through sales. And the opportunities exist. We just have to find ways to do it and we have to get the work done and we have to make sure people know the work that we're doing. So I think this is great timing to be starting a show specifically focused on procurement at Supply Chain Now. Agreed. Yeah, I I appreciate it. There's so much. All right, you got juices going now, Kelly. So (laughs) let's just dive into the first show. Okay, go. go. (laughs) What, what's so neat is is not only as we've talked about countless times, you know, the supply chain now in the recent years has finally, holy cow, finally gotten that seat at the table. Yep. Know, and, and and then the further is consumers now are connecting the dot are yeah connecting the dots and they're more aware of why they can enjoy, you know, convenient e-commerce mm-hmm. forward and reverse. And now it seems like uh, uh, the procurement profession is is seeing something very similar, right? The rise of procurement here in recent years. Absolutely. And certainly if we've heard anything in 2020, it's all the the clamoring real and not so real in terms of 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 the different strategies we use across industry there and and where and this that and the other. So it is a great time, I would assume, to be in the procurement profession, right? It's very exciting. And and part of what's made it so exciting is over the last 
nine months, a lot of the traditional rules we would typically function under have been suspended. Now, depending on where you work, that might mean a slightly different thing. So for instance, it wasn't that long ago, I interviewed the chief procurement officer of New York City. And he talked about the days of trying to find PPE and what they had to do. Mm. And he talks about how awful it was. And he said, I never want to go back there again. <laughs> I don't ever want to go back and have to do that again. So that gives you some appreciation for the boundaries we traditionally work inside of. You know, for other teams, it was about okay, we have this workforce that's been distributed overnight. We need to get keyboards. We need ergonomic setups. We need, how are we going to connect people? How are we going to handle shipping? And so we've kind of blown a lot of the traditional limitations out of the water. And things like, for instance, this is the phrase procurement never wants to hear, but we've always done it this other way. <laughs> well, that objection, just gone. Absolutely just gone. And so we are taking that opportunity to try different things, to push ourselves and others out of their comfort zone so that we can simply do what the company needs us to do to keep it rolling. Um, that and everyone now thinks they're an expert on supply chain because they know when toilet paper is and is not available and the limitations and why are there limitations. Um, so I feel like we've come up not only in the C-suite, but in general conversation. It's much easier now to explain to even friends and family okay, you're in corporate procurement, corporate supply chain. What on earth does that mean? Ah, you wonder why there was no toilet paper? Okay, now I have your attention. That's right. what we do. <laughs> <laughs> it just took uh, yep. empty shelves, no toilet paper, I guess. But, you know, um, when the consumers get educated and they become yes. more aware of professions and, and, and the sectors within the profession, so to speak, that's a great thing. That, that's it such is. a great thing. And and hopefully it'll lead to more of, you know, we're, we're in this, uh, perhaps a greater supply chain, including procurement and mm -hmm. manufacturing and engineering and all that. You know, in the end, we're, we're competing for that top talent because we need it, perhaps unlike ever before. Absolutely. Unlike never before, I, I guess, to, to say that right. And part of that battle, part of it is the awareness and, and yes. the exciting things that you just spoke about, which I think would jazz a lot of folks up to come in and, and, and take procurement or supply chain roles and, and the impact they can have. Uh, and the technology that they can they can leverage and, and the things they're going to learn and, and the upper trajectory of the profession. So uh, I love it. Uh, it's exactly what you and I had in mind when we, when we were brainstorming about what's next. And we're really excited to, to continue our longstanding collaboration with uh, the go to when it comes to all things procurement <laughs> and then some, which is Kelly Barner. Uh, so, Kelly, how can folks get in touch with you about whether it's uh, this series or you got a great podcast at uh, Art of Procurement, which we're big yes. fans of. Of course, you've got no shortages of, of content you're producing, books and other projects. How can folks reach out to you? So there's a couple ways. Probably the easiest way is find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm definitely there. I look roughly like this. Um, <laughs> so that's all you know, it's me. Uh, but you're also welcome to check out my website, buyersmeetingpoint.com. We're actually relaunching that in the first week of January. So be on the lookout for that general user experience to be improved. Um, and you can message me, you can contact me directly through the website. I absolutely welcome hearing from people. So if you have even a small comment, you just wanna say hi, if you have a question, if you're looking for something, please don't ever hesitate to reach out because I love getting to talk to folks that are doing the work. Awesome, love it. And I love the, uh, uh, you mentioned Buyer's Meeting Point, very vibrant uh, in particular LinkedIn community. So uh, yes. looking forward to uh, dropping new content that we co-create with uh, Dial P in yes. that really, really I soon. I know, video. That's right. Starting in January with our, our right. first live stream. So Kelly, uh, all, all the best. I've enjoyed this. Looking forward to this next chapter. Uh, love what you do. And um, looking forward to getting things kicked off in earnest in just a few weeks. Thank you, Scott. Me too. I'm absolutely thrilled. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. So we've been talking with Kelly Barner, owner and managing director at Buyers Meeting Point, amongst many other things, but including also host of our new one of our newest series, Dial P for Procurement. So look for that. Hey, if you enjoy this conversation, check out the rest of our conversations at supplychainnow.com. Uh, find us and subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts from. Um, on behalf of the entire team here at Supply Chain, Supply Chain Now, well, how can I mess that up, Kelly? <laughs> 
Uh, this is Scott Luton wishing all of our listeners nothing but the best. Say happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, but more importantly, a do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.